Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for an evening of exciting military fiction. Um, we are looking at Tom Clancy Red Winter, written by Mark Cameron, and we are looking at The Devil's Weapons by Peter Krusinoff. Both authors are writing in someone else's universe, but they are actually doing a great job. Um, and both authors have chosen to write um, back in time, not absolutely, well, yeah, that's right, back in time. Um, but they feel weirdly contemporary given the war going on in Russia. So do you both feel that way? I mean, it's been not in Russia, in the Ukraine, but by Russia. So I thought, Peter, your scenes in the Catian Forest and the scenes in Poland are eerily parallel, terribly parallel to what's happening in the Ukraine. And Mark, there are lots of similarities as well. Um, just timing, right? Or did you actually start writing these books while this war was in progress? How about you, Mark? No, I, it, it was conceived before there was any invasion uh, of Ukraine. But, you know, I mean, we I think we listen to the zeitgeist and feel what's going on. And um, I, I pitched this idea to Tom Colgan with, with Putnam quite a while ago, really wanting to do a, a retro. I wanted to get Jack Ryan out of from behind the the you know out of the oval office and back doing what jack ryan does best and um fortunately he agreed and it just worked out just worked out that that's the way the world is turning now so you're in 1985 um and the, the antagonist is not russia but east germany it's the Stasi, and although you know we tend to lump them together because we think you know communists and the whole bit and and i guess these germans were just a funnel to russia weren't they yeah so during that time the during the 1985 and that sort of the tail end of the cold war the russians were starting to turn their backs on on uh, the kind of satellite states like east germany and so th they were having a lot of trouble the uh, east germans were having a lot of financial trouble because the the Soviets were really putting so much of their money in their own defense and, you know, combating our, our missile systems and all that, that they weren't putting so much money into East Germany. And that kind of left East Germany out in the cold a little bit or made them feel like that was what was going to happen. And that's the time that I, I enjoyed uh, researching and writing about, because that's when I, that's when I really started my quote unquote adult life. I was a rookie policeman in 1984 and, you know, just started kind of when the Hunt Fred October came out. So it was a fun time for me to look back on, you know, revolvers and, you know, the the tools of the trade from uh, back in the, back in the, as my son and grandson say, the, the olden days. The olden days, I know, but interestingly enough, in real spycraft, according to various authors and others I've talked to, the uh, digital age has become so hackable and all the spies are reverting back to, in fact, old spycraft. Oh, know? yeah. My, one of my good friends is a retired CIA, and he, he calls the, the global war on terror, the GWOT, the global war on tradecraft. It's, it's just become less and less about human intelligence and more about signal intelligence and that sort of thing. And I try to take it back to, to that in this book. Well, if... Um, if various prognosticators are right and AI is the thing that we have most to fear, then you have to wonder whether actual <laughs> yeah. spies as opposed to whatever. Yeah. So Peter, is this your first book in the Griffin universe? It is. Um, and you have interesting credentials since we haven't met you. Why don't you tell us what qualifies you to write them? Well, um, not much except that I write fast. Um, I've uh, <laughs> written a couple of my own books and I've been a big W.B. Griffin fan forever and ever, of course. I haven't read every one of his books because he's written only about 2,000 of them. But I read all of the Men at War series, for example, and Presidential Agent and Clandestine Ops and was fascinated by them. And then same, the same culprit, Tom Colgan, got in touch with me and said, hey, how about doing uh, a W.B. Griffin? And I, I jumped on it right away. Uh, I love historical fiction, which this is. It requires you to do some research. I've been a big war World War II buff, both the European and Pacific theaters, read everything there is to, to read about MacArthur, Patton, um, and folks like that, but also theater battles, and also about the OSS. So I was really intrigued about doing it, and Tom said, well, how about the Cat and Force Massacre as a hook? 
And I always thought that was an amazing thing anyway. Uh, it, for people who don't know the Cat Massacre, there are about 20,000 Polish officers, um, uh, public officials and intelligentsia that were massacred by the Russians. And they tried to pin it on the Nazis. And of course, everyone believed it would be the Nazis, but it was actually the Soviets. Yeah. Um, the fact of the matter is, however, there was one guy, this is what I didn't know. I had presumed, even though I know my history fairly well, I presumed that they did something like, you know, lined up everybody in front of a ditch and then machine gunned them with their, you know, uh, you know, uh, machine guns. There was one guy, Major, uh, the NKVD Major Vasily Blokin, who took a Walther pistol and shot each one of these individuals, the greatest murderer in history, not greatest, the most prolific murderer in history. So there's one guy who escapes. He happens to be a, you know, Tesla, Einstein type of intellect. Everybody in the world is searching for him, including the Nazis, the Soviets, the U.S. and Britain. And there's a chase in the middle of the biggest land engagement in world history that is right on the tail end of Barbarossa through Poland to try to find this guy and rescue him. Yes, well, I'm sad we can't talk about how it comes out um, because it's really mm -hmm. quite shocking. <laughs> but, um, but there we are, you rascal. <laughs> so, um, so it says in your biography that you teach law, you're an official of a federal agency, a former member of the National Labor Relations Board. Um, so, you know, you obviously have some experience with government and all its function and malfunction. Yeah, sign of misspent youth. Um, I was on the NLRB for a few years, appointed by George W. Bush. I'm still on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, the longest serving member. And uh, don't hold that against me. Um, and um, so I've been in Washington, have seen what goes on there, much of which appalls me. No, not much of which, almost all of which appalls me. But, uh, you know, my entire family, with the exception of me, because I'm a near-do-well, was in the military. And I admire those that have worn the uniform, uh, a lot of honorable folks. And um, I, as with Mark, I know uh, a couple of people in the intelligence community, not well, but I ran some of my stuff past them just to be sure I wasn't going off the deep end. And uh, so I enjoy writing about these things because we're talking about real life heroes. And with respect to the historical fiction, the good part is you can put in the true heroes. Like it's, it's great to write dialogue between Winston Churchill and uh, say, uh, Ian Fleming, Commander Ian Fleming, who later became known as the, the author of the James Bond series, and dialogue between Wild Bill Donovan and FDR. So um, good times. It was good, Chance. I really enjoyed your writing about Donovan, who, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, was an in intelligence and ran the OSS agency during the war. He was a remarkable, um, remarkable man. But Somehow in all that, I missed the fact that he looked like a bulldog. So you now <laughs> enlightened me. Maybe slightly unfair, um, but he had a look that you didn't mess with. Uh, this is a Medal of Honor winner. He, he, he earned just about every significant medal there is in the U.S. military. Then he went on to law school uh, where he, he was in law school with, um, uh, I think it was Henry Stimson or, and or FDR. And he performed brilliantly in law school, became a prominent lawyer. And of course, he was tapped by FDR, even though um, he was a staunch Republican. He was such a great intellect and such a great talent that FDR persuaded him to head up the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS predecessor to the CIA. Right. Well, his wartime service is remarkable. Now, I have to say, we're actually beginning this book in April of 1940. I was briefly thrown. I don't know if you can see this, the chapter heading. Probably no. can't, but it took me, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, it took me like four chapters before I figured out that the <laughs> first four digits were actually the time of day. I'm going 1430, 23 April, 1940, and I'm going, what is that? Um, so I thought that was, that was interesting. Is that a standard thing in the Griffin novels? Why was it set up? Not really, way? it's a standard thing, something I've used in the past. I wanted to have kind of a, a preface or a prelude to what was happening because I try to be consistent with what W.B. Griffin does. I, I'm never gonna presume to reboot or rewrite something that a great author like W.B. Griffin did. So I needed a, a premise to get to the point where we are in uh, 1943. So it began with, while Bill Donovan talking to uh, Bill, uh, Dick Kennedy, who is the protagonist, the principal protagonist in the series, about going over to China, which in the first W.B. Griffin Men at War books, 
there was, you know, he and, um, uh, well, he went over to China to fly in Burma against the Japanese. Uh, so I wanted that preface uh, because a lot of the things that transpired or caused the events that would occur in 1943 began in 1940. No, I get that, but my question was more specific. Was it normal in a Griffin novel to have the time of day and the date? I just yes. don't remember ever seeing that. But then I, yeah, I have not. Did. I have to say, I am not a Griffin reader. Of yeah, he, he did. Book. Okay, he did. And sometimes, you know, as your your other authors know, when you have the time of day and the location, and you're spanning multiple time zones you can easily get confused. And one of the biggest problems you have is if you have a time that says 4.35 a.m. in New York, and then a couple of chapters later, somebody's doing something in Germany, well, it may have occurred prior to the 4.35 because of the time differential. So that required a little bit of rewriting from time to time. Well, I totally get it because you may not know this, but the single hardest thing about running a large Zoom program, which we do, is time zones. People absolutely have a dreadful time. I actually had an author who, I mean, a publisher who was putting out a very good novel about New Zealand. And after I read it and was asked to do an indie net pick, I said, I really ought to do some kind of a Zoom event with him. And they said, well, you can't. They said, he's in New Zealand. And I said, actually, I can. <laughs> and if it's three o'clock here in the afternoon, it'll be 11 a.m. the next day in New Zealand, which works out for everybody. But I was just, you know, I was just really surprised this far into, um, you know, the results of COVID and, and the Zoom world and all, that this is still an issue for people, is how mm -hmm. to structure um, international events. But right. it's it's actually not that hard. You just have to sort of look it up. So Mark, um, I love the fact that you went back to 1985. Um, and it was really fun to see Jack when Jack Ryan Jr. is just a baby uh, or yeah. a toddler, let's be fair. Right. Um, and, um, and Kathy is um, a surgeon and they're living in London. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what was part of your goal in the book to get them from that post in London back to Langley? Yeah, so the book is set in between the hunt for October and Cardinal of the Kremlin. So we know what happens. And I had to look for a spot. Now, Red Rabbit falls in there, but it's kind of off to the side. Um, but I had to look for a spot that Tom Clancy left where I had enough time to have some adventure and, and still end up. So all the, all the people had to end up, for instance, um, not knowing Jack if they didn't know him in Cardinal the Kremlin or having met Jack before, you know, and like I've gotten emails already. How could John Clark be in this book if he never met Jack Ryan until way later? Well, as I explained, try to be kind about it, but two people can be in the same book and not meet each other. And that's what happens in this. They're just kind of narrowly avoiding one another uh, through the whole um, process of the story unfolding. But so I just needed that time to, I needed a time where I could get them on their way for the Cardinal of the Kremlin to, uh, Cardinal of the Kremlin to happen. And that was a perfect time to have them young, you know, 34. We always envision because of the movies, I think, we always envision Jack Ryan as a bit older than Clancy envisioned him in the books. What made him, what makes Ryan so special is that he was, 34 years old, 33 when, and, and even younger than that during Patriot Games, because that, even though it came later on the timeline, it happens before the hunt for it, October. So he was a, for all practical purposes, a kid, a millionaire kid that was very brilliant and, you know, made a good investments and already a PhD. But uh, in this one, a 34 year old analyst that's, you know, socially maybe a, a, you know he's a little bit naive about politics but he is you know the political infighting and that sort of thing but as far as knowing people that's what made him so incredible and special in that clancy universe is he was a young man an extremely young man and that's what i try to show in this that you know that as people read the book they'll see that mary pat foley is kind of his mentor in this when it comes to the field and so that, that was fun because I do write about her a lot carrying on what 
Clancy wrote, what Mark Graney wrote. I write a lot about Mary Pat Foley as his, you know, kind of his right hand person in the White House as his director of, of national intelligence. And now we get to go back and see them as in their early 30s, but her a seasoned field operative and, and kind of showing this young analyst along. And that was fun. So I, I know where they ended up. Now I could go back and explore a little bit more that, that Clancy never got around to how they got there. And that, that was great fun. It reads really well, and I particularly like, you know, seeing Kathy, who is actually overshadowing Jack at this point. She's a really famous ophthalmic surgeon, mm -hmm. and um, and making so much money, she can afford to buy her own Lamborghini. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> really like that. I thought, okay, you know, zoom around London. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's an interesting thing you say because Tuesday night I did an event with two Jane Austen people, one of whom writes about um, 19th century women. Mm -hmm. um, authors as a professor as non, not narrative nonfiction, but the other has written a long-term mystery series with Jane Austen as the sleuth. And she has always said, and we talked about it again, that in order to do that, she has to look at those undocumented moments right. in Jane Austen's life, because everyone knows what Jane was actually doing or, right. you know, purporting That's to, right. if she's going to have any credibility in the book, she has to find those places where none of the letters or documentation, right. whatever it is, tells you what Jane was doing. And oh, so you're doing the same thing, really, except that that Clancy, you know, you're dealing with a fictional character, right. but it's the same problem, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it gives you a, it, it gave me a good excuse to go back and reread, you know, several of the books to make sure that I, and, and I, just as Peter said about the, the timelines and, you know, time zones and that sort of thing, I had to build a timeline that here's, here's where Jack Ryan met John Clark. Here's how many kids the Foley's had in Russia. Here's what Ed Foley was doing, Mary Pat's husband, you know, and, and here's this window. Now I can start them on converging towards the, towards what happened in, in uh, Cardinal of the Kremlin. So that's what this book, you could say it's a, a sequel to The Hunt for Red October and a prequel to The Cardinal of the Kremlin. Which is a really good way to look at it. And of course, you also, both of you had to be familiar with real events that are happening in the time period that you have chosen. In your case, Peter, 1943 principally, but 40, and in your case, 1985. But another thing you have to do to write credible military fiction is you really have to know your weapons, don't you? Because I mean, you know, it's like in a cozy series, if you kill the dog, it's all over. But in your kind of books, if you get one of the guns or whatever it is wrong, that's terrible. So Peter, what kind of weapon weaponry knowledge did you bring to this affair? Well, uh, I had, a, I confess I had to do a little bit of research because I didn't have a great inventory of knowledge related to uh, hand or um, handguns or light arms in World War II. I mean, you know, I had some general generalized knowledge, but not a great amount of knowledge. So I wanted to be sure that I was historically accurate. In addition to that, similar to what Mark did, I went back and I read the seven previous books in the series and just kind of drew a couple of timelines and other materials. So I'd make sure I was consistent with um, what had been done before by W.B. Griffin. Timelines, biographical uh, information related to the principal characters, their favorite weapons to use or the weapons that were issued by OSS at the time. And then you've got to incorporate that into what was going on in the world at the time. Yeah. You know, what, what's going on? Uh, what's Especially Churchill, who's probably, at least in my estimation, the most fascinating character, at least of that era, maybe of the last hundred years. And um, He's always doing something that can sometimes confound you. I've got a particular line in which I'm going in terms of uh, my plot. <clears throat> then I discover, well, Churchill did X, and he was sometimes unpredictable. FDR was a little bit unpredictable, but not as unpredictable as Churchill. And in addition, Churchill really, uh, all due respect to FDR, FDR, but Churchill had the ability to manip manipulate FDR. Um, in ways that weren't always clear to him. But anyway, I'm getting a little bit off the subject. Um, no, I was not an expert on World War II weaponry. Um, I just did my research. 
Oh, you know, I mean, I don't know anything about it, so you convince me, but I know there are people who live to point out mistakes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, they sure do. <laughs> like, you better believe it. You make the smallest mistake, and it's it's uh, it, it's similar to being a Civil War buff. Right? <laughs> if you go to any Civil War, uh, it, just go to, you know, let's say the uh, Civil War battlefield, and they'll have the um, um, National Park Guide they're telling the people what's going on. If you get the slightest thing wrong, he gets the slightest thing wrong, such as, well, you know, Sherman was over there on that hill at 2.42 p.m. Someone will get infuriated and say it was 2.46 p.m. So you've got to be oh, very yeah. careful about these things. So, no, you absolutely. know, naively, I assumed long ago before, I mean, I've been doing this now for 33 years, but back before then, I assumed that copy editors and publishers existed to backstop authors and that if, you know, <laughs> You screwed up and said that you know a gun had a silencer when it didn't or something they would catch it and they would fix it for you but i'm not sure if that's really true in my well, case I, it, it ahead, was true ahead. they caught a few things that i was not aware of and i had done my okay. research and they were correct on it uh so i was impressed by that and i thought i was pretty meticulous i mean i'm, I'm a lawyer I'm, i write briefs before the supreme court i try to be very precise but uh, you miss things from time to time, especially with respect to chronology. Certain weaponry may have been uh, disbanded or, or uh, dis, uh, out of use by a certain date, and you thought it was still there. Uh, you thought it was standard issue. No, it's not. And then also the foreign armaments, getting those straight, a little bit more challenging because if you go to the histories on them, you can't, they, they, they don't necessarily describe them in the type of detail they do for British or uh, American armaments. So, um, you know, the, the easy, cheap way of getting history is to, to check on certain things like a date is to go to Wikipedia. That's not the smart thing to do. You can go to Wikipedia and it may give you some ideas, but you better go to, to original source materials if you want to be accurate. And, and, and I think that's what where sometimes in this day and age we have maybe a little up on copy editors, not copy editors, but continuity editors. Because many of them are younger and we have, they catch a lot of errors. I mean, heaven knows I make a lot of errors, but not about guns because I don't write what I don't know. And so when it comes to, when it comes to armaments anyway, so if I'm going to write about a pistol, there's a 90% chance that I've shot that handgun. If I'm going to write about a rifle, there's a 99% chance that I've shot that rifle. There is a few, you know, crew served weapons and, you know, laws and, you know, stinger missiles. I never, I've never shot, but I, I try to pick and choose weapons that I'm familiar with to put into the books. Now I'm writing a different kind of fiction that Peter is. I'm not writing about actual battles that happen. I'm making up battles that happen in a real environment. And so like, for instance, in, in this particular book, John Clark gets introduced to a Glock for the first time. And we, I remember being on a drug raid back in the late 80s, late eighties, like 88, maybe eight. No, it's been before that, maybe 87. Um, and being out and I was in uniform and, um, one of the, you know, the cover officers and there was a County deputy in Texas that worked for the, on the DEA task force and DEA was very new in the late eighties. Um, and he had gotten a new Glock in a little Tupperware looking container. It was a greenish colored. It was just the most fascinating thing to all of us because I remember at the end of the raid, there was a rat that ran through the field behind the house and he shot that gun. And this was kind of the wild west. And he was like tracking that rat across the field with 17 rounds of ammunition where the entire rest of the crew, including the SWAT team only had six round revolvers. So that was the time when everything was shifting. And so I was able to write about Clark being introduced through from a former OSS agent, which was another cool part of the book. In 1985, there were still a lot of World War II veterans alive. And so when somebody went to East to West Germany, to Berlin, there was a lot, there was still, I think Kathy even mentions, there's still bomb dust in the air. It's, it's just a there was a different feeling that one might have if they go over today. So I would, I remember sitting in my, my mother and father-in-law's living room and a member of a British 
he, he was my father-in-law was a British uh, World War II veteran. He was he's quite a bit older. He's 50 when my um, wife was born. So he had older friends. And one of his friends was a former special services officer from World War II. And I remember looking back on it now, I feel like such a punk because I, I just thought, you know, I'm a cop. I know some stuff, these old guys. And I, I just, I come very close to tears when I think about that greatness that I sat in beside and didn't ask them all the questions that I should have asked them. They didn't try to mine the, not for a book, but just to know what these men went through. My father-in-law was in North Africa, the special services guy. I stupidly said, do you ever get together for reunions? And he just kind of shook his head and said, you know, not many of us came out son, you know, and they're, they're both British. Um, so not very talkative, but um, so I tried to put Clark, who we know is the, you know, the most kick butt guy in the Clancy universe in a situation where he got to meet a guy like him and a woman like him from World War II, somebody that's old in 1984 when Clark is still young. Now, when I write about Clark, he's the old guy talking to a young guy. So that was, that was just a fascinating exploration of their personalities, but also that change, that change in tides of the kind of weapons that were being used. There's a lot of new stuff coming along and stuff that like I carried revolvers, the Dan Murray, the FBI agent in this carries a model 13 revolver. That's the first gun my wife ever bought me right before we got married was a, a, a surplus FBI revolver. Um, and now my son carries a, a Glock 17 with, you know, 17 rounds and, and uh, red dot sights and all kinds of high zoot stuff where with me, it was a revolver and two speed loaders. So it was fun to fun to research that or not research as much, but relive that, that time. We're going to come back to airplanes here in a minute, but I want to go over to Peter and, and ask him, um, you know, you you spent as much time or more in your book writing from the perspective of the Russians. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Kennedy is, is in, you know, Churchill and I mean, you know, the Western team, so to speak, in the war. But you really put a lot of effort into their uh, Russian and German and Polish, actually, antagonists. Um, was that, did that just come naturally or did you deliberately? Uh, decide to tell the story that way? Well, I deliberately did. I hadn't expected it would consume so much of it, but um, bad guys are already, always more interesting, right? So when you have uh, the assassin, the NKVD, that is the Soviet assassin, Major Taras Gramov, he's a despicable, evil character. And there are a lot of guys like that during World War II. Same with the SS uh, leader, Conrad Maurer, despicable individual, but there were a lot of people like that. I drew them from historical biographies. Um, they were just fun to write. They were great characters. And um, I think it added some texture to what was going on. Again, this was in Poland and the major powers were all concentrated on Poland at the time. It was, you know, you had Operation Barbarossa, the largest land engagement in, in human history, carnage beyond imagination. The scale of the warfare was stunning. You had literally millions of people involved in this. And the Russians had huge numbers of troops. The Germans had huge numbers of troops. And I wanted to show the perspective of those two um, forces also. Now, of course, the Americans and the Brits are the primary protagonists. Candy and Fulmer are the primary protagonists. But evil people are fun to write, and they they don't get more evil than Taras Gramov and um, any of the other characters that I've got in there from the German side. In addition, we had uh, a guy who's going to reappear in the sequel, which comes out in the summer, uh, is Admiral Canaris, who they called the genius. He was the head of the Abwehr, the German intelligence service. And you've got all these intriguing characters that I was familiar with prior to writing, but when you do a deep dive. Um, we have fascinating people today, and maybe it's just the passage of time and the romanticism, no pun intended, but the romanticism 
of the passage of time that these people become larger than life. Well, I think that's true. And Canaris is, I think, a particularly interesting character, although no spoiling her, but there are a couple of surprising villains that Peter introduces us to that are just like off the wall. Whoa, where did they come from? Um, which I think is, it, it really made it an interesting book. But, you know, the truth is, Peter and Mark, I'm sure we've talked about this before, a thriller really depends more on the quality of the antagonist than it does the protagonist. If you don't have a great villain, you really can't have a great thriller because the stakes are just not going to be worth it. Right. Yeah, there, there's no doubt about that. I mean, um, you know, you've got uh, this SS commander who's just evil on steroids, and then you've got this NKVD officer who doesn't care about life whatsoever, and he's working for maybe the most fearsome character in the world, Lavrente Berea, who commissioned the killings of literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And they brooked no dissent, they gave no quarter, and you had to get the job done, otherwise you were the next person to be killed. So I wanted to raise the stakes. I thought these guys would be interesting antagonists. And it, it, as you said, I think when you have antagonists who are multi-layered, it adds something to what the protagonists are like, because they've got to find ways of countering the antagonists. I often think about, you know, Russia and how they got rid of the Tsar family thinking, you know, life would be better and they unleashed these absolute monsters instead. You know, Berea, Stalin, I mean, people died. The Tsars never achieved that kind of, you know, almost genocide of their own people like that. And of course, poor Poland geographically was just, it's always been in the wrong place, you know? Just, <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, people have washed, nations have washed back and forth across mm -hmm. Poland. Napoleon did it, you know, the whole bit. Yeah. They, um, and even Czechoslovakia to some extent, they don't have those finite natural boundaries, let's say that Spain has, you know, it's got mountains, it's got mm -hmm. ocean, you know, France, England particularly, um, and you know it's it's sort of hard to be like a carpet in the middle of, mm -hmm. of Europe that people can tromp over. Also, um, you know, and there's a wonderful series by James R. Ben about World War II, and there are Poles who are uh, important characters in it, and they've come to England to fight for the Allies because their own country you know, was, they couldn't live there and couldn't fight there. So there was a tremendous amount of, um, a pole, of Poles who, you know, left Poland, but stayed in the fight, working right. from other countries. Yeah, I talk about that a little bit in the book, that there was, you know, the, the Poles in exile, the Polish president and some of the fighters, and they would come across the, um, uh, the Baltic to infiltrate, to fight against the Germans, then they kind of you had the Armia, which was the Polish resistance, uh, who was fighting against the Germans, but they were directed in no small part by the government in exile. And these people were, um, I mean, some of the most resilient people in the world. They just got decimated by, you know, the Germans. And uh, now here come the Russians. And it's like, you know, when is this going to end? And the, the scale of carnage is almost unimaginable. It really is unimaginable. And I think your book, in some ways, I thought about it, it's almost like a treasure hunt. You know, I mean, you know, instead of a bag of gold, you've got this, um, you know, scientist who, <laughs> who clearly has, you know, some key towards nuclear fission um, and everybody wants to grab it. And, and one of your characters, I think it's in your book, not, to, uh, not uh, Marx, presently says that, you know, Germany's the immediate enemy, but America is going to be the long run enemy. I yeah, that was sure. that was the NKVD assassin, Charles. Right. Yeah, yep. um, a dreadful man, but you know, but pretty smart in that respect. So you were in a way sort of foreshadowing the Cold War, and and you know, now we're faced with a similar issue. You know, whether mm -hmm. I hope that we stay resolute in supporting the Ukraine, but you know, we'll see. So. Mark, I didn't know you knew a damn thing about airplanes. I mean, God, it's like reading Tom Clancy, and I mean, it's like watching Justice and Top Gun. What, where in the world did you get all this amazing, um, I mean, it's so real. Oh, well, thanks. I, you know, I talk to people. I, being in Alaska, we fly all the time. True. And everywhere we go, little planes, outside of Anchorage. Not one of these guys. Not one of those guys, but I, 
I'm very fortunate to, and, but because we're always in little planes, those little plane pilots learn to fly from some, you know, usually the military. So I have a lot of contacts that were former military that are former military. And I'm very, for one of the marshal service pilots before I retired, good friend of mine. In fact, I convinced him to move to Alaska to come up and fly for us. And um, he's a deputy marshal as well. But he had a contact who flew F-117s and I was able to get with him and a guy named, named Rick Wright, who um, former early on in the program, F-117 pilot, you know, the stealth pilot, the stealth aircraft. And uh, he helped me immeasurably. And, and, you know, talk about stuff that would have got us both put in prison in 1985, but uh, he's able to talk about it freely now and, and um, gave me some really good insight about what it was like to fly. And also I watched tens and tens of hours of YouTube interviews of, of pilots. And especially, you know, for, there's nothing quite like speaking to a former CIA case officer or a former pilot of a secret aircraft that can now, you know, they spent years not able to talk about what they did. Yeah, it's like and now, and breaking the code. It, it, yeah, exactly. So now that they're able to speak, boy, they're just fonts of, of information and they, they, they love talking about it. And that's the, <clears throat> that's the beauty of that kind of research is you go into it with a list of questions. What, you know, what I always call the, the known unknowns, the things that I want to know the answer to. But if I can just contain myself and shut up and let them talk, then I find out so much stuff that I would have never known to, to ask about. And so I've kind of over the years learned to um, ask leading questions and then just sit back and, and listen and let them go on their merry way. And I, I was very fortunate. I think the first Clancy that I wrote, Power and Empire, I think it was the first one, I wrote a, um, a couple of scenes about the Coast Guard the Coast Guard helicopters and their search and rescue. And that got the attention of a Coast Guard admiral who recommended me for a, a program called the, <clears throat> called the Joint Civilian Orientation Conference. So we get to fly around on military aircraft and chat with soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, you know, Coast Guardsmen, and spend a week all over the country flying in different types of aircraft, riding on different ships. And more important, I think, talking to the people that that really do that sort of thing. Um, and that's, that gave me a lot of insight. Plus now I have a, a contact with the Pentagon that I can call and say, Hey, I need to talk to somebody at NORAD and they have somebody call me. So it's, it's been very nice in that regard. Now, it just as Peter has a kind of treasure hunt scenario here, looking for the scientists, you have a similar treasure hunt scenario in that this plane has some remarkable technology, and it's not a spoiler to say that it, it has some kind of a radar radar proof or radar deflecting material, right? Coating, um, so that it's more or less invisible. It's like you know the black stealth bomber or whatever it is. Right. So when the plane crashes and it breaks up, um, the bad guy picks up a piece of it, and the object is to keep him from ever getting it back to his handlers. Um, and I thought that was really nifty technology, but I also like the fact that you are in territory, you've got helpful maps um, yeah. in the book here, like this, that right. show us where it is. And so a lot of it is Nevada and Utah. Is that That's mm -hmm. where those test ranges were, right? Right. So the test ranges are up, you know, our area 51 and, and Tonopah and those secret test ranges where we know that... Um, they had, for instance, an aggressor squadron of Russian aircraft that they flew out of there. It's not secret anymore, but back when the, the F-117 was flying and other things were secret programs were going on, I'm sure there are secret programs now. We just don't know what they are, but uh, <clears throat> that, that was in Nevada. And so I know that, you know, you can sort of extrapolate from the things that you are told. This is like, for instance, the F-117 flew mostly over the test range in early days but when they started flying off the test range they're so 
less visible to radar. They're, they're not completely invisible, but they, they give the, the radar signature of like a hummingbird. So they had to have something to give a radar signature because they had to talk to, because there are civilian aircraft flying around when they get off the range. So they actually had to bolt on a little thing that looks like half a football um, that would disrupt that their ability to be completely invisible and give them the radar signature of a, a, a Corsair, not, not the World War II Corsair, but the jet Corsair. And um, so that when they identified themselves to flight following and everybody, they were, they matched what they said they were. And so I was able to take some of the things that people had, I watched, you know, on different, read on different uh, YouTubes and interviews, and then the interviews that I did personally and, and make up a story that, that was plausible. My goal was so that when, <clears throat> when Rick or some, one of the other pilots or somebody, or a, a, a CIA case officer, when they read it, they don't have to say, oh, this really happened. I just want them to say, oh, this could have happened. This makes sense. I don't want them to, the same way that people, your rank and file person that goes to the gun range would be able to pick out right away that a Glock doesn't have a safety. And if I put that in there, that would be a terrible error. But most people would not be able to figure out, oh, this is what CIA did in 1985. But I want the real people to be able to look at it and say, oh, this guy knows somebody. And that's, that's what I'm looking at. Same with the, same with the aircraft. Well, of course, they they have these test ranges in unpopulated and rugged areas to discourage, right. you know. And so, unsurprisingly, you are then able to introduce some um, UFO, you know, enthusiasts and observers to complicate your whole crash scene because but, yeah, that's what's down there. That I've I've done quite a bit of yeah tracking training, you know, for man tracking training. It's it's really hard to track people over Red Rock Desert and that area around the Virgin River and mesquite nevada and all that i've done quite a bit of work so i was able to write about country that i know and um so that made it fun. and there's a lot of ufo watchers a lot of very most of the people that i describe i've seen in in one respect or another down there so both of you um don't hesitate to um to write about brutality and there's some you know some really efficient executions you know, was that, you know, Peter as a, as a lawyer and so forth, you know, did that, I mean, it's all extra legal. So did, <laughs> did that bother you at all to be, because I mean, you've got a really high body count in this book. Well, it was World War II. Yeah. I know. You know, there's no shrinking away from it. People were killed in massive quantities. And uh, it was, um, you know, I, I looked at, I've been a history buff for a long time, especially World War II. And uh, what struck me about some novels related to World War II is it was somewhat sterile. And when you just think about in terms of the Holocaust, you had more than 6 million people because in addition to the total of Jews, you had all kinds of other folks that were, were killed. And that was not in combat. Right. Uh, in combat, again, the scale was off the charts. So there's gonna be a lot of blood if you're going to be at least um, somewhat accurate. And when it came to the OSS, the OSS was more of an intelligence service, but they did engage in what we now call special operations. And uh, they were kind of the first to engage in this paramilitary type of activity. And then it migrated later to the CIA. And of course, uh, the institution of special operations forces. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of throat slitting back then, a lot of just uh, mass carnage. And a lot of it was visited upon the civilian population by the Germans and the Soviets. Uh, I didn't want to, I wanted to convey how brutal it all was and how the Poles probably suffered more than any other European group uh, during World War II. Now, you know, you can make a claim that the Chinese in the Pacific theater may have suffered uh, more or at least as much. But uh, it was, um, the carnage, again, was, was beyond imagining. I don't think I made my point very well, and you're absolutely right. But what I was really thinking about is the chilling efficiency 
with which you have your bad guys kill people. And, you know, Mark's bad guy doesn't hesitate to drop this woman into a, you know, knock her off into a slot canyon and, you know, slit the throat or stab some poor man. And you've got, you know, and I think it's the, as I said, it's that ruthless efficiency of killing that I found, um, I, I'm sure it was true, but um, Stephen Hunter has done a good job with that. You know, he's written some, some Spiker books. He has one about the, the Russian assassin, which I find, I can't remember what it's called, Sniper's Honor. I can't remember what it's called. It's an yeah. absolutely brilliant book. And he depicts some, some Nazi bureaucrat keeping track of the trains, taking people to concentration camps as though, you know, it's just sort of a normal day at the office, you know, scheduling freight. Um, and, and I think, I think it is that, that the Nazis in particular, and maybe these Germans too, Mark, as you're writing them, I've always thought the Russians had more emotion in it, but the Germans seem to be able to be like real killing machines. Yeah, it's a, you know, like like we say, we were talking about writing antagonists early, and everybody is the hero in in their own story. And so, when you write them, if they've got a mission, if they've got, for instance, the character that's getting the um, the piece of of tech out, he's I, I kind of envisioned him like the character in the Eye of the Needle. He he had kind of dapper, good qualities, but he needed to get this piece of tech this stealth tech out of the country and he had to do anything you know he would be willing to do anything one of the things that you know i i was worried when my youngest son got into law enforcement because he was kind of he well he's still just a sweet guy but you learn and you see the the and, I, and i'm sure peter's seen this in his career the just the hatefulness of people and the the real there are some evil people in the world um, and you see when you read history, you see the the vast the the basically the serial killers that just got the right to be serial killers under a certain government during you know Pol Pot or or Nazi Germany or under the NKVD these people that probably would have led violent lives anyway that were just had the leashes taken off or they really got a license to kill to yeah serve, it, it, you know subverting james bond but i think that that's certainly exactly. true if you look at the no. thugs around hitler you know i won't make any current parallels but nonetheless <laughs> they exist. Um, so, no you're exactly so, right so let me say before we call patrick up before we run out of time and i'm not going to do any spoilers but both of these books have a real kick in the end so you have to read them all the way through and don't don't take anything for granted. Um, I thought you both did a really okay. remarkable job there. And Peter, um, I have never read a W.E.B. Griffin book. He never came to see us. Well, that's not true. He did come once, but I was somewhere else. I'd forgotten the two of them did, father and son, because W.E.B. Griffin's son, he was the third Butterworth, right? And the fourth Butterworth. Bill Butterworth. He wrote, what, 21 of these books after, wow. with his dad and a few after his dad died. So you're the first not Butterworth to be doing this, aren't you? <laughs> or yeah, are I you am. secret Butterworth? To... Right, uh, I am. And, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's um, as Mark can easily tell you, when you're writing under the name of a giant, it's, you know, you want to be sure that you have fidelity to what his work was like, and you don't want to disappoint his fans. They expect a certain thing. Now, you can't avoid being a little bit different. Right. And, um, you know, that's okay. But you still want to stay within the frame of what he had established. I think you should give honor to the person who had sold millions of copies of books because, hey, people like that. And, you know, who might have say that my writing is anywhere near as good? So I just wanted wanted to be sure that uh, his fans would be would be satisfied that he had fidelity to um, uh, his previous novels. Okay, but Putnam has a real legacy program going, overseen by Tom Colgan. Hi, Tom, if you're watching this. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think for every author, that is the situation. You know, how to stay true to the universe and you know, in the framework that the legacy that the original author 
created, but each of you has to be an individual and write your own books too. You know, you're not robots. AI hasn't yet taken over. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think that's an interesting thing for fans. I mean, you know, the, the whole Cussler um, continuation comes through the poison pen because we were Clive's own bookstore for 30 years. Um, and so I've done events with all of them in the since he died. And it's interesting to me that the fans, the sales numbers remain almost the same and the fans are just as engaged. But I think that's because the legacy authors, um, most of whom work with Clive, with one exception now, um, have, have kept up what Clive did, you know, in the spirit that he's done it. But they also have moved it forward because it hasn't become dated or static right, right. and I you know even though you've both chosen to write an historical nonetheless that's true that you have to be moving it you know moving it forward so I think you both did a terrific job thank you Patrick you want to come and see if we have any questions from the audience or possibly Tom Colgan <laughs> sure let's see um I you weren't there Barbara when um Butterworth and, and Son I don't think so. Or if I was, I wasn't the program head. Somebody else must have yeah. been. Yeah, I remember. I remember the the elder being kind of a crusty, crusty old dude. <laughs> Just well, like he him. was an old dude. He died at eighty nine. So by the yeah. time he came to see us, he was he was almost as old as I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Russ has a question for Mark, which is: uh, Is it challenging transitioning from one series to another? as you did from Cold Snap to this book, for example? And do you write multiple books simultaneously? No, you know, I, I'm not writing the meat <coughs> of the book simultaneously. What happens is while I'm writing one, I'll take a break to do the copy edits for the one that I, you know, that I just finished. And then I'll write a little bit more. And then I'll have to send Tom the synopsis for the one for next year and, and get back to the main one or, or while I'm working on the, a Clancy I'll have to do the about the time I turn the Clancy that I'm working on now I'll have to get ready for publicity for Breakneck which is the next Arliss Cutter book so you know as far as the writing of them um, you know coming up with plot and carrying the plot forward I'm only working on one at a time um, but there's always other things to do and and the characters are so different and they're such between between the Jericho Quinn books and the uh, Clancy's, that would be a little more difficult because there are more geopolitics involved where Arliss Cutter is a deputy marshal in Alaska chasing bad guys. And so <laughs> I want those to be visceral, more like I would, when a good example would be when I'm writing a Cutter, I don't read, um, I don't we read a, a Kent Kruger book or a John, uh, a Craig, Johnson book, or I don't read a, a CJ box book because I don't want to get derivative of that kind of a book. I'll read those while I'm writing a Clancy. And then while I'm writing a, a cutter, I'll read Mark Graney or, you know, Brad Taylor or, or um, um, Jack Carr or something like that. So I, I read the opposite of what I'm writing other than my, my research for fun, but uh, they're so different that I, I do I think I can make a break. I mean, there's no way that that uh, Lola Te'ariki or, or Arliss Cutter can get away with extra judicial killings like uh, Clark does. Uh, let's see, Mark, uh, who, who tunes in a lot, he has a question for each of you, which is just simply, do you have a favorite, <coughs> Mark, do you have a favorite Clancy novel? Um, and um, Peter, do you have a favorite Webb Griffin novel? Uh, I, I like Cardinal of the Kremlin, probably the best. Uh, Webb Griffin, it's hard to say. In my series, um, trying to think which one is my favorite. You're talking about the Men at War series? Yeah, it's the Men at War series. Uh, you know, I've, I've read most of it, the Presidential Agent, for example, and Clandestine Ops. I like so many of them. I don't know that I have one favorite. I'd be afraid of mentioning one and then, you know, somehow disparaging the others. They were all good. Let's see. Um, here's a question about <clears throat> about um, just about writing in general. Do you do you guys what kind of word word processing 
do you use Microsoft Word? Somebody's asking this or another setup or do you write by hand, longhand? Go ahead, Peter. I write by longhand. I write the old fashioned way. I'm here in my law office at my firm and in off hours, I'll sit here. In fact, I first began writing a few years back when I was in a flight from LA back to my hometown of Cleveland and I had nothing to do. I just started writing on the, on the, uh, the tray table. And uh, before I got to Cleveland, I'd already had three chapters. I write very fast and it helps engage my brain when I write by hand. Um, when I type, which I do in my legal practice, it is not as quote unquote literary. It's um, more regimented, precise. Obviously it's not entertaining. Um, and what I find is my best writing occurs on Saturday mornings at about six o'clock when I get stoked up on multiple cups of coffee and I just sit down and I don't even have to think about what I'm writing. I just start writing physically the word the. And once you start doing that, I'll speak for myself. Once I start doing that, things start to flow. I already may have a preconceived notion of where I'm going, but uh, the actual physical act of writing somehow engages my brain. That's great. That's, That's great. I, a lot of authors, actually. Just, yeah, absolutely. I, I write a ton. I, I wouldn't say I write even half the book longhand, but I, I write probably a third of each book. I, I have cups and cups of these Blackwing 602 or ERA pencils. I write with a fountain pen, uh, many, many notepads. Um, I like the feel. I like what it does. For one thing, when you're writing longhand, you can do it anywhere. So I can do it on a beach. I can do it on an airplane. I can do it out in a cabin. I don't have to worry about electricity. And you don't check your email when you're writing longhand. You're not, it's the best focus. You know, you have Word as I normally, to answer the question, I write on Word um, just to, because I don't have, I have Scrivener, but I don't have the bandwidth to learn how to use it yet. And I'm always too busy. So someday maybe I'll learn how to use it. But right now I, I scribble on paper and, and, transpose it into word and that uh that's an extra editing step uh, i i free write and plot the whole book on longhand and then then i might write a chapter here a chapter there and sometimes even type i have a couple of i think you can probably see one in the background i have a little uh, like a trans a little uh, portable courier i mean uh, corona typewriter in the back and a couple of uh, german typewriters that sometimes i'll type just for fun because i wrote for years on a typewriter and got rejections so it's it's sort of you know it's 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 nice to go back and write the old way let's see here uh okay on youtube uh, tracy asks uh, hi mark and peter besides starting a new story what still gets you excited about writing or being an author hmm well, I'll say everything no, is go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I enjoy writing. I've always enjoyed writing. Um, the fact that I'm a published author is just a dream of mine. There probably is no more boring and soul crushing job than being a lawyer. Now, I happen to have maybe one of the most exciting and fun practices around. I really do. I've got a great practice, but compared to writing, it doesn't even hold a candle. And so uh, everything about it is fun. The fact that, you know, I'm participating on this is fun. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's like taking a vacation and getting paid for it too. Well, Peter, I can tell you that it's actually more fun being a bookseller than being a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I got to, I got to <clears throat> quite early. I was in my late forties. So, um, you know, I've had a wonderful time being a bookseller. I didn't know you were a lawyer. That's yeah. cool. That's I was cool. a librarian at the Library of Congress, and then I segued over into becoming, I actually read the law in Virginia, which That's means I can't cool. practice law except in Virginia because I didn't go to law school and I can't take the bar exam here in Arizona. That's cool. Though. So that's the reason that's they started cool. the bookstore. Yep, I had a, a wonderful moment when my last and best husband, the one I've been married to now for 32 years, said to uh -huh. me one day, now that you can do whatever you want, since you're not practicing anymore, what is it you're going to do? And, you know, that's a, that's a great thing. I, I did, Peter, I did a, a, a thing for Arizona. I can't remember which Arizona lawyers thing because I've done a lot of things with them. But I got to speak to one group that were preparing to retire. 
And I said to them, if you're really lucky, either you can say it to yourself or someone will say it to you. Now that you can do whatever you want, what is it you're going to do? And few of us are actually prepared to answer that question. Yeah. But you've already found the answer, right? Because you could write. Uh, absolutely. And you know, but I'll tell you, I thought I had the answer almost 30 years ago. Um, I have a facility for emulating writing styles. I've just been able to do it throughout my entire life. And then I ran into a brick wall, and that brick wall was Elmore Leonard. And I try mm -hmm. to emulate his writing yeah. style. Oh. And despite the fact that it looks simple because he has the spare writing style, it was crash and burn. I, I could not do it. So I abandoned the hope of being an author and continued to practice law. And then, as I said, one day I was on a plane, come from LA, started to write. Next thing you know, it turned into a complete manuscript. And uh, here I am today. It's hard, hard, hard to write like Elmore Leonard, to pare it down to that degree. I don't know how he does it. I'm still it's missing. Just amazing. Remember that great line, if I'd had more time, I would have written shorter. Uh -huh. <laughs> so true. Patrick, how are we doing? Should we have one more question? Let's see. I think. I have to go down to the bookstore and do this all over again <laughs> with, a, with yeah. an author who is a Mossad. He's a veteran of Mossad, and he's written a book oh. um, about uh, Tobruk and invasion oh, really? of Sicily. His name is Stephen Hartov, and I'm telling you, if you think your books have a high body count, wow. <laughs> I bet. That's about it, really, for the questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, guys, what a pleasure to talk to you. Mark, are you going to come see us with your your whatever next attic, which book is coming out? Arliss Cutter. Yeah, Arliss yeah. Cutter, Breakneck, will come out in April. I hope so. I haven't heard yet. They're They're setting up some kind of tour in April, so I hope so. Well, for those of you watching it who like to have Mark actually sign the books that he writes, if he comes down in April, uh, let us know if you want us to hold your Clancy, because we could do that. Um, it's impossible. It's not impossible. It's impractical to ship books to Alaska and back. It costs an absolute fortune, and mm -hmm. um, and nobody really wants to pick up the freight for that. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't really pay for Putnam generally to tour legacy authors, because other than here, where people seem to continue, Mm -hmm. um, most places are not that interested in, in the signature of the legacy author, you know, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work that way. So, um, but we're always happy to see you and Peter, we'd be very happy to see you if you want to come visit us. I'm That's thinking cool. that one of these days, we're just going to do a military fiction convention. There you go. I'm going to get Jack come. and Mark and Don and, you know, you guys, and I can round up the whole universe of, of guys for, yeah. Um, I actually have Hunter coming with um, Don Bentley's going to host it and Brad Taylor on oh, January wow. 23rd, which well, I think will be, be really, really interesting. Yep. So anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Happy holidays to you. Have a very Merry Christmas. And um, Patrick, I won't see you at the store, but I'm heading down there for my next round. Sounds Thank good. you. Thanks very much. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. You too. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.